Paleogenetics is a field of experimental science where we use recombinant DNA technology and biotechnology to bring back to life genes and proteins from ancient organisms that have long ago gone extinct. We can do that because today we have many people doing sequencing of the genomes of many organisms. So your human genome has been sequenced as well as chimpanzees, gorillas, many primates have had their complete genome sequenced as is also the case for many other mammals, many other animals. And because of that, we can infer the sequences of genes and proteins from your ancestors. So for example, the last common ancestor of you and a chimpanzee, we have a relatively good idea of what you had by way of genetic makeup. And that's also true for the last common ancestor of you and a dog and a cat, or you and a bird, or you and a fruit fly even. So paleogenetics is the process of trying to learn about the history, your history, the history of life on Earth, by bringing back to life parts of uh, the genomes of ancient organisms. Um, many examples of this exist. One of our favorites uh, was concerned with how and when primates started to drink alcohol. Alcohol on Earth is only about 80 million years old. And we know that because we have used paleogenetics to bring back to life the enzymes, the genes, the proteins in yeast that ferment grapes to make alcohol, which is what you drink as wine or ferment other things to make beer or other kinds of alcoholic drinks. We know that actually yeast only started to make alcohol about 80 million years ago. That's partly because fruits like grapes only emerged about 100 million years ago. And so it took some time in evolution before we had the opportunity to make alcohol at all. But then we have the ability to infer the sequences of genes and proteins that make enzymes that oxidize alcohol in your digestive tract. So when you drink alcohol, the enzymes in your throat, the enzymes in your esophagus, the enzymes in your stomach start to metabolize that ethanol. Those enzymes are found in homologous forms in chimps, in fact, in all animals, uh, but in rats, for example, the enzymes that are related to the enzymes that you have in your digestive tract do not themselves oxidize ethanol. So what we can do is infer by going back in time the sequences of genes and proteins um, and tell you when your ancestors started to drink alcohol because this is when the genes and proteins that we resurrect from ancient organisms start to be able to oxidize alcohol. So for example, the enzymes in your digestive tract that were present in the last common ancestor of you and chimpanzee were able to oxidize alcohol. Also, between the ancestor of you and gorilla was able to oxidize alcohol. But the ancestor of you and orangutan, for example, or the ancestor of you and a baboon were not able to oxidize alcohol. So we can say that about 8 million years ago, you had a mutation in the enzymes in your digestive tract that uh, oxidized alcohol about 8 million years ago, they started to be able to oxidize alcohol. And we know that because we do paleogenetics. We infer the genes and protein sequences of these ancient enzymes, bring them back to life using the magic of recombinant DNA, study them in the laboratory. And so we know when those enzymes in your digestive tract started to make, uh, be able to drink alcohol. And that's about 8 million years ago. So the question is, how do you know what the gene sequence is of a organism that lived and died 10 million, 8 million years ago? And that's sort of the same way as we infer the sequences of ancient languages. So the word in English for snow is snow. The word for snow in German is schnee. And the word for snow in Russian, for example, is schneeg. And so these are all words in Indo-European languages. And by comparing them, we can guess what the structure of the word for snow was in the Indo-European language, which was spoken 10,000 years ago, where we have no modern uh, speakers today. It's the same thing with proteins. If we look at the sequences of the amino acids in the proteins from humans that are in the digestive tract and look at the sequence of the amino acids in a chimpanzee, as well as in the orangutan, as well as in the baboon, just like we can infer the sequence of letters in ancient words 
by looking at the sequences of letters in the derived words, we can figure out what the sequences of amino acids were in the ancient proteins, and that's how we bring these back to life. Um, the second thing, of course, is you can ask, well, why did you learn how to drink alcohol about eight million years ago? Well, that's roughly the same time as you were coming down out of the trees and starting to walk across um, the ground. Of course, when you're in the trees, you eat fruit by picking fresh fruit and then eating it. That fruit has not fallen to the ground. It has not had its husk damage. It has not been infected by yeast, so it has not made any alcohol. However, the minute you come out of the trees, you start picking fruit up off of the ground. That is fruit that has fallen. When it falls, the outside of the fruit becomes damaged. Then yeast can start to infect and you can start to make alcohol. So the idea that you started to be able to drink alcohol at the same time as you came down from the trees and started walking around, which is the first time you started picking up fruits that contained alcohol, makes a consistent picture about your ancient history. Of course, this has major impact on our view of alcoholism. You obviously are drinking fruits that are fermenting. That's wine, maybe 10, 15% alcohol. It's not yet vodka, which of course is distilled. To do vodka, you must have civilization. You must be able to heat things, cook things, and distill things. Lots of examples of this now. We have resurrected ancient genes from bacteria that lived three billion years ago. This is about three quarters of the way to the origin of life on Earth. These are enzymes that are optimally active at high temperatures about 65 degrees centigrade. And so we know from that that the bacteria that were living three billion years ago were living in a hot spring. They were living at very high temperatures. And that's the start of the diversions of all modern bacteria on Earth. And that comes from paleogenetics, where we resurrect ancient genes and proteins to learn what those ancient organisms were doing. It's like resurrecting ancient words from ancient languages also. So. If we know that there is an Indo-European word for snow, then we know that Indo-Europeans Indo lived in a place where they had snow, that it was not in Africa, it was not even in Italy, it was someplace north in Northern Europe. And the minute you know something about the language, you know something about the, uh, the environment of the people who spoke it. Well, that's the same thing with paleogenetics. When you resurrect ancient genes, ancient proteins from ancient organisms. You not only learn about the genes, but you also learn about the environment of the organisms. You learn about how they are adapting to changing environment and changing climate, for example. A third example, in addition to the ancient alcohol enzymes and the ancient uh, bacterial proteins, is uh, you know we've looked at the genes and proteins in cows as they learn to eat grass. Well, the grass is only about 40 million years old on Earth. The steppes of Central Asia are not very old by comparison to many things geological. And so, you know, the cows learned how to eat grass about 38 million years ago. We know that in part because we can resurrect the ancient proteins in the cow stomach that are used to digest the grass, and of course used to digest the bacteria that live in the cow rumen to, to digest the grass as well. So paleogenetics is providing many examples that connect DNA sequences, genetics, to the environment and to life. We are learning a lot about how life adapts to changing environments by looking at ancient forms of life, at least in small pieces. So you may wonder how you go do these experiments in the laboratory. Well, it starts by doing the sequences of the genomes of many different organisms. That's like collecting the languages, Finnish, Russian, English, German, Italian, and so on. Then you go to a computer. And so the computer analyzes the sequences of nucleotides in the DNA, amino acids, in proteins, just like Linguists will analyze the sequences of sounds in words and letters in words. Then the computer then builds a model for how a family of proteins has divergently evolved, what amino acids have changed, what amino acids have stayed the same in the proteins. And from that computer model, you build sequences of the ancient proteins. Then it becomes time to do recombinant DNA technology. DNA synthesis is relatively easy. If you know the sequence, of the gene that you want to have from an organism that lived 
eight million years ago, you go to a DNA supplier and you type in the sequence that you want them to synthesize, you pay them some money and they will send you the DNA that uh, is coding for the gene for the ancient protein. Then it's back to basic biotechnology. Once you have a gene for a protein, you can put that gene into a bacterium. The bacterium is a little machine and it will make the protein for you. This is recombinant DNA technology. We use it all the time. We make insulin by recombinant DNA technology, also from synthetic genes. But here we are making the ancient protein from an ancient synthetic gene whose sequence we have inferred by looking at the sequences of all the derived genes. Then the graduate student goes to work. They purify the protein, study it in the laboratory to learn whether it oxidizes alcohol, whether it is able to survive at warm temperatures, 65 degrees, or whether it you know, digests grass in the stomach. And this is how we connect the laboratory work on an ancient gene that has been made by inferring what the sequence was by looking at many modern genes, how we connect the behavior of that ancient gene to an ancient environment and ancient life. There are about 100,000 different gene families in all of life on Earth. But there's only one history of life on Earth. That entire history will be told together with the geological records, the fossil records, as well as the genomic records and the paleogenetic records. So at some point, perhaps in the next 10 or 15 years, we will have an entire history for life on Earth, at least going back two or three billion years. And from that, we will be able to understand a lot more about the intimate connection between genetics, environment, survival, fitness, and life itself.